Thank you, ladies. I'll have to admit I haven't heard some of those verses before, uh, but we appreciate that. And uh, you can't go wrong with uh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. That would be a wonderful day, amen? amen? And then that song we probably all learned when we were tiny, Jesus Loves Me. Uh, you can't beat that, can you? Amen. Thank you, ladies, for doing that. This is some of our ladies go out to nursing homes on Monday nights, and we're thankful for them and thankful for them coming up and uh, sharing that with us tonight. If you have your Bibles tonight, if you'll turn with me once again to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and we're going to continue here uh, tonight in chapter number 41, uh, Genesis chapter 41. It's a lengthy chapter, so we've uh, taken it a couple of uh, messages, two or three messages here, and uh, my plan was to get in chapter 42 when Joseph will meet with his brothers, but uh, we may have to save that till next week, and uh, so that'll give you a little something to look forward to next week, because the Bible's exciting, amen, and uh, it's always good to look in the Bible and study out of the Bible and, and learn from the Bible, because we believe it is the Word of God, and it is life-changing, and uh, so many interesting things in the Bible, and uh, so I, just my advice is get in the Word of God sometime and study and read and meditate. And I guarantee you to change your life, amen, and to make you a better person, make you a stronger person, and make you a more faithful person, more loving person, and uh, maybe you need all of those, so get in the word of God. But this morning we saw from Genesis chapter 41, as we saw where Joseph is exalted, Joseph is in, of course, in prison, Pharaoh has this dream, and uh, the chief butler remembers Joseph and says, oh, I forgot about Joseph, said he interpreted a dream for me, came out good. And so he tells Pharaoh, and Pharaoh calls for him, and Pharaoh tells the dream to Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dream, and uh, once again, he has to tell the truth. And, you know, we, we oftentimes overlook that. Uh, he had to tell the truth to the chief butler and chief baker, but here he has to tell the truth to Pharaoh. You know, here's the world's most powerful ruler, the world's most powerful man, and uh, really, you know, Pharaoh left Joseph in prison here. The Bible says he'd been two more years in prison after he interpreted the dreams for the butler and the baker, and so he really had Joseph's life in his hand, humanly speaking. And the thing about it is, you know, Joseph could say, well, you know what, I, I better not tell him this. I better tell him good news. Everything has to be good. I can't tell him the bad news. I can tell him about the seven years of plenty where everything's going to be great and everything's going to be good and the crops are going to be bountiful and everything's going to go good. But I'll just leave out the part about the seven years of famine. Well, he couldn't do that. You know, when we speak the truth, folks, you have to tell all the truth. Amen. What do you do when you take an oath? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. And so uh, that's what Joseph is doing. He's telling the absolute truth. He's telling the whole truth here, whether Pharaoh likes it or not. And so Joseph's brought in, and he's brought in to Pharaoh, and he gives the interpretation. But he didn't stop there. And we would think, well, he's a Hebrew, he's a slave, he's a prisoner. You know, he's told Pharaoh what he wanted to hear. And so now Pharaoh can go on and do what he wants to with that information and Joseph's thinking, well, maybe I'll just go back to prison. You know, I'll just go back and languish in prison. Maybe there another year, 10 years, 20 years. I don't know. But he's brought in, and, and as we begin looking this morning in verse number 33, Joseph offers advice. And I find that interesting right there, that he, number one, he offers Pharaoh advice. He says, here's how you can uh, solve this situation. Here's how you can deal with this situation. Here's my advice. Here's my suggestion. Here's my help. And so that's interesting. I think it shows Joseph's heart. But not only that, Pharaoh takes his advice. And, you know, to Pharaoh, Joseph was really a nobody. He's a Hebrew, he's a slave, he's a prisoner. He's not an Egyptian. He's not the royal court. And, uh, you know, he's not one of his advisors or magicians or wise men. And so, but he takes Joseph's advice. And Joseph gives him his plan here. And he says, well, Pharaoh, here's what you need to do. You need to set someone up over Egypt. And what they need to do is they need to store up during those seven plenal years uh, when it's plentiful and bountiful, they, they need to store up 20% of the grain or the wheat, the corn, food, and put it in a granary or, or a silo or a storehouse. And then when the seven years of famine take place, you'll have food reserved. And you can distribute that and people can live and we can make it through this famine. And so Pharaoh says, well, that sounds like a good idea. But I don't really know who I can put in position here to take care of that. It's going to take a lot of planning and a lot of work. And, and, and just a lot of uh, organization, administration. It's going to take a whole lot of that. And I don't know if there's anyone in Egypt that wise and discerning and discreet to do that. And then he thinks, you know what, Joseph? You're the man. You're the one who's wise and discreet. There's, there's none such as wise and dis discerning and discreet as you are. So I'm going to set you over this. I'm going to let you do this. And so he brings Joseph in, and he, and he gives Joseph uh, 
his signet ring and he dresses him in this fine linen and puts a gold chain around his neck and, and Joseph becomes second in command in all of Egypt. And it's interesting there because Joseph had been exalted. He had been humbled. He had been humiliated. And now he's being exalted. And that's what we see with Jesus Christ. Now, as we get on in today or tonight, we're going to see, uh, we've seen Joseph's plan, we've seen his position, and we've seen his power. Now, tonight what we're going to see is we're going to see his prosperity and his provision. And also, as we go through here, I'll also bring out some things I think we see maybe some similarities with Jesus Christ, of the life and experience of Christ. But begin reading with me tonight, verse 45, Genesis 41. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zophnoth Paaniah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. In the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handful. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering for it was out without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons. Before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenty, plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Did I mention this morning that maybe God has Joseph here for a reason? Amen. Maybe he has him here for a purpose. Maybe he has him here for a reason. Remember, maybe he has you where you're at for a reason, for a purpose. And I think God had Joseph here for a reason. Because we look at this and we say, well, this doesn't work out every day in life like this. You know, Joseph's story, it starts out bad and there's bad things happen, but everything turns out for good with Joseph. You know, that can happen to us. I mean, we may not be second command of Egypt. We may not be feeding the world with grain, but... We see God's hand in our lives. You know, we get set back sometimes. There's troubles, there's trials, there's tribulations that happen in our lives. But God's always there with us. He's always bringing the good out of that. He's always teaching us. He's always uh, either teaching us patience or to lean on him more, to trust him more, to have more faith in him, to follow him more, to be more obedient, whatever it may be. No accidents, no mistakes with God. And we see this in Joseph's life. Joseph's uh, put in second command in all of Egypt. The only one more powerful than him is Pharaoh himself. Now remember, Joseph had gone from a young boy of 17 years old and just in 13 years had risen to second in command in all of Egypt. Now, if we could get on in tonight to the next chapter, we're going to see even more why God had this take place because we're going to see why the children of Israel ended up in Egypt. Does Joseph appear to his brothers? What does he do when he sees his brothers? So I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll see that now. If we go back to the beginning of verse 45, Pharaoh began to kind of acclimate Joseph into Egyptian culture uh, where he would be an Egyptian. He would talk like an Egyptian and walk like an Egyptian and dress like an Egyptian and act like an Egyptian. And so he's an Egyptian, so to speak, as far as Pharaoh's concerned. You know, he's no longer this Hebrew slave. He's no longer this Hebrew prisoner. That's why he's second command. He needs to dress like that. He needs to act like that. He needs to talk like that. And he needs to, to be an Egyptian, okay? And so, first of all, he changes his name. Now, this was his uh, Egyptian name. Sometimes Egyptian, it's known as a Coptic name. And the name is called Zafnath Paania, which there's different interpretations. You have a Schofield Bible. It probably says revealer of secret things. And uh, that's more of a Coptic term, an Egyptian term. You know, there, there's different interpretations. But whatever the, the interpretation, he gives him an Egyptian name. He's trying to make him an Egyptian, okay? Now, Joseph still worships God. Joseph's in this position. But Joseph doesn't change his convictions. He doesn't change who he is. Just because he's in a different position, 
And you know, that, that's a really a lesson for us when we see this verse. It doesn't matter what position you're in. You may be president of the United States. You may be governor of the state. You may be CEO. You may be uh, top dog here or wherever it may be. But you know what? That shouldn't change who you are. Amen? That shouldn't change who you are with Christ. You be, you be godly. You be loving Christ. You be a Christian wherever you are, whatever position you're in, whatever place you're in. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it could be the lowest occupation. It could be the highest occupation. Be consistent in your Christian life, who you are. Be that. And so Pharaoh changes his name, and he gave to Pharaoh, or he gave to Joseph, a Gentile bride by the name of Asenath. This was a uh, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So she's a Gentile. Now, we see the similarities with Christ here. Joseph's rejected by his brethren. What does he receive? He receives a Gentile bride. Remember Jesus, John chapter 1 and verse 11, Jesus came into his own, and his own received him not. He's rejected by his brothers. Many didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe it. They thought he was blasphemous. They thought he was a, a liar, and they thought he was crazy. And he was rejected by his brethren, but he receives a Gentile bride. We think of the church, the Gentile bride. One day presented to Christ. We saw that back months ago as we studied through the book of the Revelation. So we see that. So Joseph, rejected by his brethren, receives this Gentile bride. And it's interesting here because she's going to be the mother of two of the more prominent tribes uh, of Israel right here, Manasseh and Ephraim, which we read about. These are two of the more prominent tribes, which are going to have tribes, uh, the double portion that Jacob will give to Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so very interesting here as we see throughout this passage. So he's, he's given a wife, and the Bible says Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now, why did he go out? Well, there's several reasons why he went out. Remember, Joseph had a plan. He came to Pharaoh, and he said, Pharaoh, here's what we need to do, okay? We, we need to store up, during those seven years of plenty, we need to store up a, a one-fifth or 20% of the goods right here, the supplies, the resources. Put them in granary, silos, storehouses, whatever. We need to store that up. We need to save that, put that back, okay? And then when the famine hits, we'll be able to distribute that. People can come over all the world, and they can buy this, and we'll have bread, and we'll have grain, and we'll have food, and we can feed this part of the world, so everything's going to be fine. So what he's doing, he's implementing his plan. He goes out and he examines, he surveys the economic conditions of the land. He surveys the resources. Now, isn't that a good thing to do? If you know anything about planning or organization or administration, you have to have a plan. You have to work that plan. And so he had a plan. He says, well, here's what we need to do. He didn't just say, well, you know what, I, I'm just going to, Ask God to help me, and, and I'm going to sit back here on this throne. I'm second command now, and I'm going to let God take care of it all. We know God can do that, but listen, folks, God wants us to be busy, amen? Maybe God has a job for you to do. God said, I can do this, but I want you to be a part of it, and I want to work through you and in you and, and let you be a blessing to others, and that way you can honor me and glorify me. And so Joseph could have sat back done nothing, but he went out. He said, I need to implement this plan. I need to go out and survey and I need to take an inventory and to investigate and see everything out here because we're going to have this great plan, and this is going to be a life and death situation. Remember, folks, seven years of famine. You know, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we have a, a few weeks in the summer when we don't get rain, and we start rationing water, and the ground dries up. We don't have any crops, and book is pretty tough. But you know, usually it doesn't last that long, does it? I mean, we'll eventually get some rain within a month or so, but I mean seven years right here that they're going to, it's a life and death situation. So Joseph had to know what, know what he was doing. Once again, Pharaoh had to trust him. Pharaoh had to believe him. He gave him this position. Of course, God ultimately gave the position, but Pharaoh had to trust him and say, well, I, I believe he knows what he's doing. I trust his word. I believe him. I have faith in him. I trust him that he's going to take care of this because if not, it would all come back on Pharaoh. If, if there's no food, there's no bread, Everyone's going to be complaining to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you're our leader. You're our king. We don't have anything to eat. People are dying. People are starving. Cattle are dying. Uh, sheep are dying. All these things are dying. It's your fault. You're the one responsible. So he had to have a lot of trust in Joseph. He had to believe in Joseph. So verse number 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, does that ring a bell to you? That's interesting, isn't it? How was Jesus when he began his public ministry? He was around 30 years of age, Okay. Joseph entered the service of Pharaoh at around 30 years of age. I find that interesting right there. So it's been 13 years. He was around 17 when he was sold 
cast into a pit, and sold as a slave. So he'd spent 13 years there, maybe 10, 11 years in Potiphar's house, maybe two or three years there in prison. So 13 years of his life, almost half of his life, he had spent in Egypt right here, either in Potiphar's house or in prison as a slave or a prisoner. But we see how God's working in his life. God's molding him and making him and, and letting him, allowing him to do these things. And so Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt to investigate, to take an inventory. Notice in verse 47. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Now, Egypt becomes the breadbasket of the world. You know anything about the climate and the geography of Egypt? Egypt was very dry. They had very little rain, and they depended on the Nile River, the overflow of the Nile River. The snow would melt in the mountains, come down the Nile, and it would overflow, and the fertile soil. And so that's what they depended on. They never had years like this before. I mean, they had enough food to get by and to feed everyone. But you know what I see in this? I see God's hand of blessing upon the nation of Egypt. And you say, well, I thought Egypt was a bunch of pagans. I thought they were uh, idolaters. I thought they didn't worship God. But remember, God was blessing them. Why? For Joseph's sake. You remember that? We saw not long ago, Potiphar's house, everything he did, you know, he was blessing because Joseph was there. God said, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. Going back to the promise of Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, now to Joseph right here. And so we see seven years of bounty, seven years of plenty. I mean, everything's just growing wild. There's corn and there's wheat and there's grain. And everything's growing. I have to say God was in this, amen? God was doing this. God was allowing this to take place. God was giving them bountiful uh, fruit here and, and harvest. He was giving them everything they needed right here because God had his hand on Joseph. Remember, we've already read, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, remember, Joseph didn't think, well, you know what? I've given this to Pharaoh, and there's going to be seven years of good and seven years of plenty. Joseph could have said, you know what? What if there's not seven years of plenty? Then he's going to come at me. and he, My life's in his hand. He's going to execute me because I've lied to him. You see, Joseph, not only did Pharaoh need to trust Joseph, but listen up, Joseph needed to trust God. God, you give me the truth, aren't you? God, you're telling me the right thing, aren't you? Yeah, he believed God, and so he believes God. Then he gives that message. He conveys that message onto Pharaoh. So Joseph had to trust God. He had to have faith in God. He had to believe what God had revealed to him was going to take place. Now, we look at our lives today. Aren't we in the same position today? Amen. Don't we need to believe what God has told us it's going to take place? do we need to trust God, believe God, believe his word and say, God, you promised to forgive me. You promised to save me. You promised to give me a place in heaven. I'm going to trust you. I haven't seen that. You know what we sing here just a few minutes ago? What a day it will be when we see Jesus. Now, has anyone seen Jesus in here? I don't think you have, have you? You've not seen Jesus face to face. But you know what? We sing that song by faith. Because when we sing it, we, I, can, I can just picture when I was sitting there and, and that song was being sung, one day we're going to see Jesus, amen? Now, I don't know all the details there, but I believe it with all my heart that we're going to see him. If not, pack your bags, get up, and let's get out of here because we're being told lies in the Bible, amen? But we're not being lied to. It's God's word, but we have to trust his word. That's what Joseph had to do. He had to trust his word. Was it taking place? It's taking place exactly as God said. Seven years of plenty. Brought, the earth brought forth by handfuls. I mean, it was more than enough, more than abundant. Verse 48, Joseph implementing his plan. He gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. Now, what he did, you know, some people think, well, he had this great big storehouse, this great big granary or silo, in the capital city there, and he brought all the food there. Well, it looks like he, he did it locally. You know, like there would be a silo in this area of the country, and there would be uh, one in this area and one in this area, because that way when they begin to distribute it, it would be easier to do that. And so he's storing all of this up in, in these storehouses around the nation of Egypt. Egypt's a pretty good-sized place. And so he has all these places here, and he's storing up here in the cities where they can protect it, where they can guard it, that way someone doesn't come in and say, you know what, I'm going to go in here in about the third year. I'm going to steal a lot of this. And boy, if I have this, I can get rich and make a whole lot of money, okay? That wasn't Joseph's idea. 
What he had, he was looking out for others. He was looking out to help others. That was Joseph's character. That was his demeanor. That was his behavior. And so he sets up all these granaries around the nation of Egypt, and they begin to collect this food. Once again, Joseph had to trust God. God, I believe your word. I believe as I do this that you're going to honor this, that you're going to bless this. When we go through that tough seven years of famine, that there's going to be enough food for us to live on. He had to trust God. Verse 49, Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. Now, haven't we seen that through the narrative of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You're going to have a progeny. You're going to have descendants as numerous as the sand of the sea. And, you know, sometimes you look at that in what's known as hyperbole, which is an exaggeration. It's saying, boy, there's going to be a whole lot here. And that's what he means here. And it says here, Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. That means he couldn't measure it. You know, he had an accounting method there, and it got so much he couldn't keep records of it. That's nothing but God blessing him. Amen. Nothing but God right there. And so he gathered corn as the sand of the sea. Notice it says very much. Now in Hebrew language that means a whole lot, okay? It means really there's no word to, 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 to describe how much is coming here. Very much until he left numbering for it was without number. It was beyond measure. You know when God blesses folks, he blesses us beyond what we deserve, amen? He blesses us way beyond what we deserve. Way beyond what we, what we could ever ask for. He he, he does imaginable things, things that are we can't even fathom, we can't even think that God does for us because he is God. He can do that. He has the power to do that, and he has the love, the compassion uh, towards us to be able to do that. So Joseph gathered the corners of the sand of the sea. Verse 50, and to Joseph, this seems like a little parenthetical part here, but to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. It happened before the famine. That's interesting there. It was happening during the good years, during the seven years. And you know what? As we see these two boys, you see in the Bible, the Bible calls for two witnesses, okay? I think you see witnesses here to Joseph's life. So in verse 50, it says, uh, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bearing to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Now what does Manasseh mean? Well, it tells us. For God said, he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Now let's look at that verse again. I want you to notice here, the main character here is not Manasseh. Okay, look at that again. It's not Joseph. He called the name of the firstborn. Many times the women would name, but here Joseph named. But he calls the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Look at the next two words. For God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Where was his trust? Where was his faith? Where was his eyes? It was on God. And here we see that he says, God has done this. God has made me forget all my toil, all my affliction, all that I've gone through here. And not only that, all my father's house. Maybe for years Joseph had that in his mind. Maybe he had revenge in his mind. Maybe he thought one day, you know what, I'm going to get back at my brothers. I was a young man. They threw me into the pit. I cried and screamed for help. They didn't listen to me. We'll see that in the next passage, in the next chapter. And, and maybe he had this, uh, you know, grudge in his heart for revenge. I don't know. Maybe he thought about that every day when he went to sleep there in the prison. And maybe he thought about his brothers. You know what? I love my brothers. Uh, but, but they were so mean to me and they were so harmful to me. And they, they hated me. And they were angry with me. They were jealous of me. And they were envious of me. Maybe every night he went to bed he thought of those brothers of his. And we're going to see later he especially thinks of his younger brother, a young boy by the name of Benjamin, which was his full-blooded brother. But we see right here that he says now God's allowed me to forget that. He's allowed me to put that out of my mind. He's allowed me to move on with my life. That I'm not going to hold a grudge and I'm not going to hold on to that and I'm not going to let it drag me down and hold me down, but I'm going to move forward. And so he names this child Manasseh, which means one who forgets or forgetting. But not only that, there's another blessing. Remember, you see things a lot of times in twos here. Joseph had two dreams, Pharaoh had two dreams, there's a chief butler and a chief baker, which are two, they had dreams, and here we see two children. It says, the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And you know what, there's a good lesson in that, I think, because sometimes when we hold on to, to sin and we hold on to grudges and we hold on to animosity and, and jealousy against people, you know what, folks, we cannot be fruitful in our Christian lives if we hold on to that. Do you agree with me? We can't be fruitful. You know, we, 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 we hate this person right here. This person harmed us. 
or, or, or this person said something bad about us, this person criticized us, and we hold those ill feelings in our hearts and in our minds, and, and, and we just can't get out and be fruitful for the Lord because we're always thinking, how am I going to get back at this person? How am I going to hate this person today? How am I going to be angry at this person? Where God says, look, let it go. Let it go. Let, let me take care of it, okay? Confess that to me. Get rid of that. And God said, I'll help you to forget it. I'll help you get through this. And then you can be fruitful. Now, look with me in Philippians chapter number 3. Look in Philippians chapter 3. Two witnesses here, forgetting and being fruitful. Okay, forget, forget what's happened to you in the past, Joseph, and move on, move forward, be fruitful. Philippians chapter 3. Remember what Paul said in verses 13 and 14, Philippians chapter 3? He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What does he say next? What's that word? Everybody say that word there. Forgetting. Forgetting. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what Joseph's doing here? We forget that, we move on, we be fruitful. I've known some of the greatest Christians, they're held down because they hold on to a grudge, they hold on to some sin in their life, they hold on to what someone's done to them over their life, and they won't forget. We have a hard time forgetting sometimes, don't we? But you know what? We don't have a hard time sometimes forgetting about going to supper, do we? When it hits 5 or 6 o'clock, boy, we don't forget that, do we? And we don't forget to turn the television on when our favorite show's on. But sometimes we forget God, don't we? We don't always put God in our lives. But you know what? We like to hold on to those things like that, that harbor sin in our lives. You know, we like to hold on to that grudge. And Joseph said, I forgot about it. God allowed me to forget it. God allowed me to move on. He's allowed me to be fruitful. And so he names his two sons this, Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth, the seven years of famine, began to come according as Joseph had said. It's exactly what he said. It's happening. It's taking place. And the dearth was in all lands. But notice the last part of verse 54. But in all the lands of Egypt, there was bread. Why was there bread in Egypt and nowhere else? Joseph was in Egypt. You got that? Joseph was in Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph. God had his hand on Joseph. God was blessing Joseph. Joseph was in Egypt, so all are going to be blessed because of Joseph right here. said there was bread in Egypt. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Notice in verse 55, Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. Now you know what, that's interesting because if you look in John chapter 2, you remember Jesus was at a wedding in Canaan of Galilee? And he went to that wedding, and he was going to turn the water into wine, and, and uh, his mother came to him and, and told the servants there, says, whatever he says to you, do it. Isn't that what they say here about Joseph? Pharaoh said, you know what? When you come to me for bread, you're crying to me bread. Go over here to Joseph. Joseph's the one. He's the chief administrator. He's the one handling this program right here, okay? And so whatever he tells you, that's what you need to do. You need to, that's good advice from Pharaoh. And you know what the advice Mary gave to the servants there at that wedding? Whatever Jesus says unto you, you need to do. You know what? That's still good advice today, amen? Whatever he tells you to do, it'd be good to your advantage to do that and to do what he wants you to do. Verse 56. So we've seen the prosperity. Here's the provision. Verse 56. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. Now that's interesting because remember, Joseph has a father still living. Remember Jacob? Now we remember him. Still has some brothers living, doesn't he? Okay, where are they at? Well, they're down in Canaan. It says over all the face of the earth. Now, sometimes in, in Hebrew scripture, in Hebrew writings, it talks about all the earth. There could be that local area right in there, but it says here all the earth. So evidently there's, there's a pretty good famine covering the earth. And Joseph did what? He opened all the storehouses. Now, what could he have done there? He could have said, you know what? I've stored all this grain up, and I've kept all this grain, and you Egyptians have put me in prison, and you Egyptians have been mean to me, and you Egyptians have made me a slave, and you Egyptians didn't listen to me, and you didn't trust me, and you didn't believe me, and you accused me of these things. You know what? I've got all this grain here. I've got all this wheat. I've got all this corn, whatever it was. I've got all this stuff, and you know what? When you Egyptians come to me now and ask for food, I'm going to say, no way. Isn't that what some of us would do? We say, oh, we're not going to do it. Or you know what we might do? We might say, well, how much is it worth to you? This guy over here is going to pay me $10 for a sack of grain. 
But you know what? Guy over here is going to pay me 15. So I'm going to take the 15. Forget about the guy with the 10, okay? You see, it's a time he could have been dishonest. He could have really lost his character and his witness and his testimony for the Lord. But the Bible tells us here that says Joseph opened all the storehouses. You know what? He opened his heart to these people, didn't he? He was concerned about him. He had compassion on them. They're starving. They're dying. I need to get food to them, okay? I need to do this. I've implemented my plan. I've, stayed, I've saved all this grain. Now it's time to put this plan in action. Now it's time to distribute what I've saved up. And so he does. Opened all the storehouses and sold into the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. That means it kept getting worse and worse and worse. Drier and drier and drier and drier. And less food and less food. Notice verse 57. All countries came into Egypt. Now, if I had time tonight, I'd go to the next chapter because it's going to see why and what takes place when these countries come to Egypt. So all countries came into Egypt to Joseph. Why? For to buy corn. Because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Do we wonder why God had Joseph in this position? You know, what would anyone else have done? Someone else, less integrity, why? They could really abuse this and misuse this. But as we see here at the end and as we close tonight, you see, all are going to be blessed because of Joseph. All are blessed because of Jesus. Now, doesn't the Bible say Jesus is the bread of life? You see, Joseph's kind of the savior of the land right now, okay? If it wasn't for Joseph and this plan, people would be dying, people would be starving. It would be a rough situation. But because God laid this upon his heart to have a plan, to implement the plan, to take a risk, to do what he felt God was leading him to do, he did that. He didn't ask questions. He didn't ask Pharaoh's permission. He went and did this, and because of his uh, planning, because of his wisdom and what God had laid on his heart, now people are going to live because of Joseph. You see the similarity with Christ? Because of Christ, folks, many people are able to live. Joseph's the savior of the land, but listen up, Jesus is the savior of all. He's the only one can die for us. God had Joseph exactly where he wanted him. Think on that tonight. God, you have me exactly where you want me. What do you want me to do? What's your plan? What's your purpose? And help me to do that. But Joseph had a compassionate heart. And I thank God for this man right here tonight because it saved a lot of people physically. But I thank God most of all tonight for Jesus Christ who not only saves us physically, saves us spiritually, and saves us eternally. May God bless you tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you tonight. Lord, we thank you as we look at this great passage of Scripture, this great character of Joseph tonight. And we see, Lord, how you worked in his heart and his life, and you gave him this plan. And as we read this sometimes, Lord, it just fascinates us to see your hand behind the whole scene, how you moved, how you acted, how you blessed. You gave a lot of goods, a lot of resources here in Egypt. They didn't love you. They didn't worship you, but you did it because of Joseph. And then Joseph was able to take that, to store it up, and then to be a blessing to others. And, Lord, we see a picture of Christ in this. is Jesus Christ. When he blesses us, he blesses us beyond what we deserve. Great grace, great mercy, great compassion, great love. As we see Joseph, as might be with the Savior, the deliverer of the land, but we see Jesus is the Savior of all. He's the life giver. He's the one who's given us eternal life. Father, I pray tonight you'll bless our time of invitation. Lord, if there's someone here tonight that needs to respond publicly, I pray you'll move in their hearts and move in their lives. Help them to realize, Lord, that they need to do what you would have them to do. That's what Joseph did, and help us to take a lesson from him tonight and to do what you've called us to do. Bless our time tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.